Bonjour à tous et bienvenue. Hey y'all, welcome. Hey Redeemer, good morning. Welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you've joined this. These moments of together praising Jesus, lifting up his name, worshiping him uh, and hearing what's happening in the life of the church, seeing one another a little bit on screen and then listening to God's word. Man, these are important things and it's so wonderful to be able to do it together. So whether you're watching this morning and you're by yourself or with your household or with your family or whether you're with your life group, you are so welcome. It's wonderful that you're watching. And in just a moment, we're going to uh, have a time of worship, of praising God together. Normally when we get together, we sing a lot. At this time, if you're in a group of people that you don't normally live with and uh, singing together is not possible, that's totally fine. Uh, we, we worship Jesus in all sorts of ways and it doesn't have to just be in singing. You can sing by yourself, you can sing in moments when it's with your family or your household, but you don't have to sing together when we have these services. And so what I'd love us to do is turn to Psalm 23 together as part of our worship uh, this morning. I'd love us to look at Psalm 23. Ella is going to read it for us in just a moment, but I'd love you to have it open uh, with you on your phone, in your Bible, Psalm 23. And then after she reads it, you can just pause the video and by yourself with people that you're watching this with, why don't you just you, let the Psalm help you to worship God. Pray short prayers of thanks of who God is and how he shows himself in the psalm. Just pray from your heart. Doesn't that need to be long prayers, but just have a few people leading out in prayers of praise and thanks. This is also worship, so don't hold back. Go for it. And then when you finish that, you can press play again. And if you want to, you can sing if that's appropriate. There are a couple of songs, but if you're in a group and, and uh, it's not possible or appropriate, just fast forward through the songs. That's totally fine and get to the next part of the service. But feel it at home. You're probably watching from home. Feel relaxed this morning. God wants to meet with you. God loves you. God is for you. And what a joy it is to be in his presence. So let's look at Psalm 23 together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are eroding your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. of the sun to the ending of the day one day alone be praised every nation tribe and tongue all creation lifting up your name
Isn't it wonderful just to be able to praise God? Let me pray this we finish off. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, we're so grateful for your amazing love and your amazing power. Thank you that we get to worship you, whether through singing along to YouTube songs or looking at your word in Psalm 23 and just expressing our thanks to you. God, we love you so much. And even as church seems not normal at the moment, we're not able to have big gatherings. Even, Lord, by ourselves, in small groups, with our families, with our life groups. Lord, will you be lifted up? Will you be exalted? Pray, teach us how to worship together. Teach us how to be the church with one another. God, we love you so much. Amen. Hey, let's carry on with the service. Hello everyone, uh, today I want to share with you a testimony of how my mom uh, was healed from COVID-19 infection. So currently she lives uh, in Nigeria and towards the end of May she noticed that she was getting um, some illness symptoms and at first she dismissed it as just a normal malaria infection that could happen in that part of the world where they are. But later on, uh, she realized that it was a little bit more because she started experiencing breathing difficulties. So she was taken uh, to an isolation center um, uh, where she couldn't have any contact uh, with any of the family. And uh, it was a very uh, challenging time for her. Um, but God's hand was all over the whole situation. So when she arrived, between the uh, 24 hours after she arrived, there were actually three people that were wheeled out dead in the same room that she was actually in. And she was really scared for her life and worried and asked that uh, we pray. She sent out messages to her friends, she sent also sent to, to me as well. And I, uh, I contacted Chris and we were able to pray in one of the Sunday evening prayer meetings for my mom. And uh, to God's own glory, um, after prayer, uh, nobody died in that isolation center till she left. So she doesn't know what happened afterwards, but while she was there, uh, actually nobody died again. And um, during the time that she was there, we were praying that God um, would heal her completely and that she would come home to us as soon as possible. Um, but it didn't happen like that. But we can see that God's hand was in it because she was able to minister to a dying patient the first evening that she was there uh, about Jesus. And even though the person couldn't speak, the person was blinking in response um, uh, to her message about the love of Jesus. And um, that person died the next day. And even in that place, she was able to minister the gospel to three other people who accepted Jesus uh, as their Lord and Savior before she left. Uh, after five days, she was moved to another isolation center. And we were still praying for healing and she was already recovering slowly. And even in that time, God used her to also uh, uh, minister Jesus' love to other people. And by the time she was leaving on the very day, they were having daily devotions and she was discipling them uh, and teaching them about the love of God. Uh, my mom's situation was very, very bad. Her oxygen levels fell um, around 50%. And usually when you get to that position, your organs start to shut down. And tests show that one of her organs was already shutting down. She was very close to death. Um, it was really a life and death situation. We were all scared. But thank God for the power of prayer. She was fully restored. She's back home again. And it was not just about her. God had a bigger plan. Even in her illness, what the enemy planned for evil, God turning around for her good. And through the situation that she went through, numerous people now know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So I just want to encourage you today, in whatever situation that you're going through, don't give up. God has a plan. God loves you. And in the end, God, God's name will be glorified in the situation that you're in. God bless you. Good morning, Redeemer. My name is Catherine, and I have three notices for you this morning. The first one is a very exciting one, and that is that over the summer, we are going to be hosting some social events. This is a great time to come together as a community, have fun, get to know each other, and get outside and enjoy God's beautiful creation. All the details for this were in your newsletter on Friday, or you can go onto the website 
and get all the details that you need there. If you are not able to join us physically, if you are not comfortable doing that yet or unwell, we would still love for you to join us online. We have a couple of events online. We're having a quiz evening and just some fun moments that we can still gather together and we would love you to join us for that. Throughout the summer, we're continuing with our prayer meetings. Prayer as a community is a great opportunity to gather together before God and to give Him glory and worship and to hear from Him. And we have those on a Sunday evening at 8 p.m. And on weekdays, we meet at 8 a.m. for half an hour of prayer. And starting tomorrow, we are also going to be doing a lunchtime prayer gathering. That is at 12.45. All the details for these meetings can be found in your email. So if you check them, all the details are there. And we'd love you to just gather together with us in prayer. Our last notes today is about giving. Here at Redeemer, we believe that part of our worship to God is to give, to give joyfully to Him. So if you consider Redeemer to be your home, we invite you to do that. And all the details of how you can give can also be found on the website. So if you go to redeemerchurch.nl forward slash giving, all the details for how you can give are there. Good morning, Redeemer. Um, when I think of forgiveness, I think of being wanted and it, the privilege it is to have God's grace lavished on us and how great the Father's love for us that there's nothing I can do that would disgust him to the point of being unable to save me. There would n there's nothing I can do that could, would, dis would lessen his power to save me and more than that there's nothing i can do that would lessen his desire to save me and i think that's I, when you consider a love like that it it, it 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 does it does stir you up in a different way it does do something to you um that forgiveness god's forgiveness means um that i'm wanted that you are wanted I think forgiveness can be very challenging because it confronts you with your own pride. And um, uh, yeah, I think I really need God to help me in that sometimes because um, yeah, can, yeah, sometimes it's not that easy. Forgiveness is something we hear about and talk about quite a bit. But to go over to action takes a little bit, it's not so easy, it takes a little bit longer. The offense that you take stays in your mind and the longer you think about it, the bigger it gets. I argued with God, I defended my actions, but I was brought time and time again to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Forgive me my trespasses as I forgive others. And Luke 4, 11, 4 says, forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who has offended or wronged us. I knew I had to do it because I sin daily and expect forgiveness. I meditated, contemplated and prayed for quite some time, but it did not want to be let go of me. I persevered because my relationship with God was important to me. Then one day, out of the blue, when I didn't expect it, it happened. My offense changed into love. And the burden fell off my shoulders. I was free to accept God's blessings and thereby release the other also to be blessed. Once my friend asked me, forgiveness for the things that you have done against me. My ego did not allow. There are situations that I need to ask forgiveness, still my ego did not allow. There, there, there was always be a battle happen between my mind and my heart. My mind says, don't forgive, don't ask forgiveness. My heart says, forgive and ask forgiveness. God help me to overcome the situation. When in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 says, 
for if you forgive men the trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive men the trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses this is how god help me to overcome the battle between my mind and my heart de allereerste keer dat ik uh, gods vergeving voor de eerste keer ervaarde uh, toen was ik 15 op een zomerkamp en uh, ik besefte opeens voor de eerste keer dat toen Jezus aan het kruis hing, toen hij stierf voor mijn zonde, dat hij dat voor mij deed en dat mijn zonden waren vergeven. En uh, daar ben ik hem uh, nog elke dag dankbaar voor. Good morning, Redeemer. Uh, 15 years ago, I accepted Jesus in my heart. Uh, I remember that night, the first thing that God did in my life was forgiving my father after many years. Uh, when I arrived home, it was 1 a.m. Uh, we had I had a chat with my father until six in the morning. That night I noticed uh, that the hatred is replaced by love, uh, and I started to see God's changes in my life. Uh, praise the Lord. Good morning, Redeemer. It's great to be able to join you this way. Uh, also for joining you in your series on Acts and uh, we're in Acts chapter 3. Uh, PJ started off uh, with talking about this wonderful miracle uh, that took place. Uh, Peter and John said silver and gold we do not have but what we have we give you in Jesus name stand up and walk and the guy walks and jumps uh, for joy and people are amazed and then Chris uh, shared last week on how God uses uh, ordinary people to do extraordinary things by the Holy Spirit. How we do believe and see instant healings at times, but also the times where we pray for people and we do not see healing or healing yet. And uh, to have faith also, not only for breakthrough, but also faith to persevere and to battle. And today I'm going to take the second part of this preaching that Peter has. And um, we're going to read from verse 17. So if you've got your Bible with you, um, then let's read from verse 17 onwards. It says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive, until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers, you shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. This is the second sermon that is recorded addressing uh, the, the early church. And the first sermon was uh, at the day of Pentecost. And here the second sermon, you would think that Peter would take the miracle as a preaching point. But he doesn't. He goes back to Jesus Christ and he puts him again center stage like in the first sermon. And he starts off and says in verse 17, And now, brothers. So he's using the and now. And by saying it this way, he is saying this is a turning point. This is a, a pivotal point. And it's not longer just for the crowd, for everyone's ears to hear. It is, but it is also for you personally. It is a heart-searching moment. And he says, and now, brothers. Peter's got some challenging things to say. And he wants his listeners to know how he sees them. And he sees them as a family. 
And he says, this is close by. I, I want you to know that I love you guys. And these listeners are not so sure. They loved what they saw in this healing of this lame man. They loved the presence of God in the power. But they weren't so sure about this preaching about Jesus. Deep inside, it confronted them with stuff. And it was like a kind of war that was going, a tugging war going on. They struggled with that truth. I don't know if you've ever been there yourself, you know. You see something and you're amazed in one way, but you're not so sure in the other way. I remember being brought up as a Roman Catholic boy. I'd never seen people raise their hands in worship. And I saw people, uh, masses of people at a conference lifting their hands in worship. And I was amazed. And, and, but at the same time, I wasn't sure. You know, I saw this guy with his tears running down his cheeks in worship. I was so amazed. I heard people speak in tongues. I, I was drawn to it, but at the same time, I wasn't that sure. And here in Acts, we see people dead grown up being taught about the coming Messiah. And what they saw and had seen of Jesus wasn't actually that he fitted that bill. In their humble opinion, Jesus wasn't doing it. He was turning their religious view upside down. And they would argue that Jesus would have never died the way that he did if he was the Messiah. You know, he had come and it feels he had gone and he had not taken away the oppression by the Romans. You know, their view was so different. And he says, brothers, you know, at times we might have to say some pretty tough things to one another. Things that would be challenging. And it's so vital to know that, that we are family. I love that with family. You can have these debates, but you do not fall out on one another. And the question here is, is, what were the challenging things that Peter was addressing the crowd with? I think one of the things he's saying is that you cannot bank on what the world offers any longer. You cannot trust in religion and follow some rules to get there. He says it's only Jesus. It's about making a choice and to put your trust in Jesus Christ alone, not just for your salvation, but also for God's plans for your life, for your destiny, and to have purpose in your life. I think one of the other challenging things that he had was he confronted his listeners with the fact that they'd killed Jesus Christ. He said he wasn't a criminal. He wasn't the Messiah. And he brings it kind of gently. He says, in your ignorance, you killed him. That's why Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross, cried out and said, Father, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Peter says, I know you were blind, but nonetheless, you killed him. Ignorance doesn't make us faultless. Being ignorant doesn't make us right about anything. You know, to, to my shame, I must admit, I've been there a couple of times in my life. You know, I'm not a very good gardener. Well, I'm not a gardener at all. I do it. You know, and uh, once I'd been taking uh, all the rubbish out of the garden, at least I thought, and in my ignorance, I cut the, the plants and left the weeds behind. <laughs> One moment, you know, not so long ago, you know, a couple of, well, a year and a half ago, uh, I had cut, of the two trees, remaining trees, I cut the wrong one uh, and removed it. And I must say, I did it in complete ignorance, but it didn't make me right. <laughs> you ask her nay, and she'll tell you. I could share a few more of those, you know, ignorant faces in my life, but praise God, time doesn't permit me to do so. <laughs> but I think Peter was the best guy to talk to the crowd about ignorance. You know, this is Peter who denied Jesus three times and he could not say he was ignorant. He knew. Jesus foretold him that it would happen, but you know, but he was the right guy to talk to them. 
And Jesus came to Peter and restored him there at that beach, you know, where they had done some fishing, they returned to the shore. And Jesus was there and he restored Peter beautifully. You know, the next challenge that Peter gives here is, he says this, Repent and turn back, each of you, that your sins might be blotted out. You know, through repentance, you're coming home. The story of the prodigal son, he is at this pigsty, squandered the money. And he thinks in his mind, I shall return, I shall get up, turn round and go to the Father. That's what repentance is all about. You get up out of your desperate situation. You turn round, turn your back on the stuff and walk towards the Father. Peter says, turn back. And the turning back is best translated as flee away from it. Be desperate enough to no longer stay where you are. And someone said this, the blood will only cover what we ourselves uncover. Jesus cannot help us if we are not coming. Those that are not turning, God cannot help. And repent is not so much about agreeing, it's about following. It says, God foretold by the mouths of all his prophets. So what was this foretelling? The foretelling was that Jesus would come and that Jesus would suffer, that Jesus would die and that Jesus would rise again. And Peter says all the prophets talked about it. How is it possible that man, many, many ages ago, decades ago, said stuff, said things that would only come to pass many, many years later? Well, the answer is this, for mere man, that is not possible. But man moved by the Holy Spirit, for them it's possible. It says in 2 Peter 1 verse 20, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know, some theologians have started to put question marks to God's omniscience, that God knows everything about everyone and everything about everything, one, whatever time, in the past, present and future. But these theologians have questioned this, and that's what's called open theism. What they say is that God does know most things, but he is needing to adapt to future choices that we make and things happening which have been unforeseen even by him. I'm not so sure, but they might even put this coronavirus crisis and uh, pandemic into that category, that God had not foreseen this. And as they see it, all these things have are dependent on our own free choices and it's difficult for God, therefore, to know what we are choosing. And so the future is genuinely open and even unknown to God. So God, what they say, learns from what happens. He responds to what happens and he plans accordingly and adapts as it's been given and presented to him. And he has at times to change his plans, reassess what's happened and learn from the past and adapt it accordingly into this situation. And for those theologians, what they say is, well, that doesn't alter our general view of God himself. Well, I think it does. <laughs> I think it does big time. How can you view this? How can you see this for it not to have an effect on how we view God? You know, what would be the error if we start believing this? I think one of the things that would happen is we wouldn't trust God any longer as in being God and being sovereign. How can you trust God if he's no longer the unchangeable one? If he becomes the great adapter, if he becomes the great improviser, he's no longer sovereign. And it will most definitely have an effect on how we think and see our lives for the future. 
You know, it, it has an effect on the way we pray. You know, how can you pray and leave everything in God's hands? It will have consequences on our times of worship. How can you worship a God who doesn't know what's coming next? And believing this doctrine will make us rely much more on ourselves. We'd rather take things into our own hands than leave them in the hands of a God who doesn't know. You know, it will, we will increasingly rely on our own abilities and our own gifts. And John Piper says about open theism, Open theism dishonours God, distorts scripture, damages faith, and if it's left alone and by itself unchecked, it will destroy the church and the lives of people. I love what it says in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, that he, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. We have eternity in our hearts, but we have no way of finding out the beginning from the end. But God, praise God, he does know. He knows everything about our tomorrows. And what God foretold is also what God fulfilled. Not only does he know our history and history in advance, he creates it. He's involved in it. He makes history. He's not just creator God, having created it and leaving it up to us. He isn't sitting in heaven and waiting till everything unfolds. No, he isn't. He's not watching us as a kind of a spectator. He says in Hebrews, chapter, uh, Hebrews he says that um, as we have such a cloud of witnesses, let's press on, let's run the race. We are one another's spectators. We are watching and cheering one another on. But he's much more than that. He's involved. He's the potter. He's molding us and shaping us. He is the vine dresser pruning us so that we bear more fruit. He is totally involved in our lives. I love what it says in Jeremiah. I have known you before you were formed in the womb. I already knew you before you were born. I sanctified you. You know, it's incredible to think about this. I have no idea how this works, but what I do know about this is that you and I are planned. There's a purpose for our lives. He loves us. He is filled with grace over us. And Peter tells about these prophets, also that these prophets spoke about two other moments that would happen two other times in verse 20 and verse 21. I'm going to finish with that. He says there will be times of refreshing and there will be times of restoring everything. You know, that last thing might take a while, the restoring of everything. That is when Jesus comes back. When that will happen, we don't know. The Bible says that the Father has kept this time to himself. But before that time, you and I can enjoy times of refreshing. When you come to know Jesus, this is a time of refreshing. It's already there. The promise of refreshing is that we are receiving the Holy Spirit to refresh our souls and to refresh our spirits. But I think the biggest refreshment is that our sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. The load is unloaded, the burden is gone, and we can lift our hearts and hands up to him. Through forgiveness, these times of refreshing are entering our lives. You know, a director of a large mental institution in England said to John Stott a couple of years ago, he's a, he was a scholar, and he said to him, I could send half of my patients home tomorrow if only they could find forgiveness. Isn't that sobering? You know, the good news is this. In Jesus Christ, you and I, can find forgiveness for all our sins. 
and be totally free and find refreshment. Refreshment will come not only by the Holy Spirit, but through forgiveness in our lives. Our great God is involved with our lives. Times of refreshing will come. Also times of restoration at the return of Jesus Christ. There will come a moment of a new heaven and a new earth. All the sins gone, no tears any longer, no illnesses, nothing. Let me summarise and say this. We might think that we are history makers and that we make history. We might even sing about being history makers. You know, but the only one who is truly a history maker is God himself. He has his hands on this world. It says in Hebrews that he carries this word, world by his word. Our great God is totally involved with our lives. He knows everything about our tomorrows. Praise God that everything will work out for good for those that continue to love him. Amen. Shall we pray together? I thank you, dear Jesus. I thank you for your goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you're not a bystander in our lives. You're not here to just cheer us on and hope for the best. Well, thank you, Lord, for being involved totally in our lives, that you know our tomorrows, you know our struggles, you know the things that we go through. Lord, you are more than just cheering us on. You're helping us forward. You change us, Lord. You prune us. You shape us. We need your hands on our lives, Lord, and we ask you, will you do that again? Will you show us more, Lord? And I pray that times of refreshing will come to people that have listened to this, Lord. They will turn back from, from anything they find themselves in and be desperate enough to get up, turn around and walk towards the Father and find, Lord, a real release and time of refreshing also for their lives. We thank you, Lord. Refresh our souls. Fill us again with the Holy Spirit. Let us be on fire and stirred by you, Lord. Also for the days to come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and have a great week ahead.